Hello there, AP Environmental Science class. Welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter 15, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, we left off uh, in part one. We first started in part one talking about energy efficiency uh, kind of in general, um, and then we started to get into more of the nitty gritty of the types of renewable energy that we have out there, and we looked at solar energy uh, in part one. So now as we head into part two, uh, we're going to move on, and first off, we are going Going to talk about wind energy. So uh, 15.4, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using wind power? So wind is one of the fastest growing, least expensive, and cleanest ways to produce energy. And wind is actually an indirect form of solar energy because how does wind uh, develop? Well, the uneven heating of Earth's surfaces uh, and Earth's rotation causes the wind to blow. Basically, the uneven heating causes areas of low pressure and areas of high pressure. Uh, as you know, uh, wind Wind likes to blow from high to low, from high pressure to low pressure, uh, and then Earth's rotation uh, then uh, deflects the wind with the Coriolis effect, either uh, to the right in the northern hemisphere or to the left in the southern hemisphere. And again, this causes wind. So wind is actually an indirect form of solar energy. Uh, what is a wind energy? How does it work? Well, basically, kinetic energy, uh, which is the wind, uh, energy in motion, is captured by the wind by wind turbines. I'll show you some pictures of those in a second, even though I'm sure you know what they look like. Uh, these turbines are then grouped together in wind farms, either on land or at sea. And as the turbines spin, they basically create electricity that then goes out into the electrical grid. So here is what we're looking at, right? These are what these big turbines look like. Here is a, obviously a wind farm out at sea, uh, but there are definitely wind farms uh, on land, especially in California. Uh, but I notice uh, them around uh, not so much our general area here in the tri-state area, uh, but you go a little farther north from here. I know uh, when you head into Massachusetts um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the Mass Pike, you actually see uh, a bunch of wind farms, wind turbines, there. So they definitely are around. And again, uh, we're beginning to see more of them. So how does it work? They're actually very simple. You got a power cable. The wind makes the turbines uh, spin. You got the generator of the gearbox, excuse me, which then takes that kinetic energy of the wind, the spinning of the turbine and produces electricity that then goes out into the electrical grid. So again, really, really simple. So let's talk about it in a bit more detail, how we use wind to produce electricity. Again, those tall, long blade turbines can extract more energy from the wind. Uh, again, it's a rapidly growing power source, not only here in the United States, but also China and Germany. The future is going to be offshore wind farms. And why is that? Because the wind... Uh, doesn't stop blowing a lot over the ocean. Why is that? Well, because the ocean doesn't have as much friction with the wind as the land does, right? As wind blows over land, uh, you have friction, not only with the land surfaces, but with mountains, trees, buildings, etc. Well, over water, uh, that friction is reduced dramatically. So uh, the wind can blow a lot stronger for a lot longer of a time uh, offshore or over water. And that's why the future is really going to be offshore wind farms. Wind power has the potential to produce four 40 times the world's current electricity use. Think about that, okay? Uh, if we can harness all the wind and get all this power in there, uh, we actually would produce 40 times uh, the actual amount of energy that is used in the entire world. All right, so again, wind, uh, this wind power really uh, could do us some huge favors uh, as we go down the road. Wind is abundant, widely distributed, and inexhaustible. Again, this is a renewable resource, right? It's never going away. And it's mostly carbon-free and pollution free as well, creating electricity uh, via these, these wind farms, these wind turbines. There's a high net energy yield because of that, right? Doesn't cost a lot of money to, to create these, uh, these wind farms, but you get a lot of energy from them. So the, high, the net energy yield is very high. Uh, largest potential areas are usually in rural areas. Uh, you may need a smart grid to uh, need it to connect all the electricity uh, to the rural. Again, this is where you're going to get a lot of wind, not necessarily in big cities. And that's why we don't see a lot of these around our tri-state area here because you know, we're not very rural here. Uh, we're rather urban. Backup power source may be needed. Uh, an alternative could be a large number of wind farms in different areas connected to a smart grid. And then depending on where the wind is blowing the hardest, you would uh, get your electricity from one wind uh, farm and then maybe the wind dies down there. You get it from another wind farm, another area uh, that the wind is blowing. So maybe you could do something like that uh, for days when you don't have a lot of gusty wind. But again, all in all, uh, wind power really really has a lot of advantages. So let's take a look at some of the advantages. As always, there are going to be some disadvantages that we need to be aware of. 
Um, but advantages with wind power, high net energy yield, widely available, low electricity costs, little or no direct emissions of carbon dioxide and other air pollutants, and they're easy to build and expand. Win-win here. Disadvantages, you may need a backup or storage system when the wind dies down unless connected to a national electrical grid. Some people consider these wind turbines visual pollution. Okay, the uh, low noise, uh, low level noise does bother some people. They do make a little bit of a noise. So if you happen to be living right next to a wind farm, maybe you're not going to like it. But again, the noise is very low level. And again, we can kill some birds, birds if not properly designed and located, even though, again, uh, the disadvantage there is, is very low. So when it comes to wind, uh, the advantages really outweigh the disadvantages. Uh, and so hopefully as we head through this uh, this 21st century uh, that we're going to begin to see wind producing more of, a, of our electricity. And I do believe that is what we're going to end up seeing. All right. So we've now talked about solar power uh, as a renewable energy source. That was in part one. We've now talked about wind power as a renewable energy source. The next energy source, renewable, we're going to talk about is something called geothermal energy. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of geothermal energy? Well, geothermal energy can supply many areas with heat and electricity. Geothermal energy has generally low environmental impact, very similar to the wind turbines. Um, limited number of sites, however, where it can be produced economically right now. So that's kind of the issue with geothermal. Only certain parts of the world uh, can you do this. So what is geothermal energy? Well, geothermal energy is tapping into Earth's internal heat. So we talked about how, um, or maybe we didn't, how the Earth has some uh, of its own internal heat uh, way down in the ground. And that's what geothermal energy does. It, it taps that heat, right? Geo, geo uh, geology, thermal, right? Heat, right? Tapping that heat. So basically, it's heat stored in soil, underground rocks, and fluids in Earth's mantle. What's a geothermal heat pump system? Uses temperature differences between the Earth's surface and the underground. Fluid is carried through a closed loop, and this can heat a building in winter and cool it in summer. So let's take a look at this. Uh, these are these geothermal heating and cooling. So let's take first, first let's take a look at the heating part. Uh, what do we have here? We have water, that uh, pump, that takes this water way down into the ground, right? So down in the ground here, it is hot, right? Well under the ground, you're tapping the Earth's uh, internal energy source. So the water here gets hot, 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 right? And then finally goes into the house where it's pumped through the house to heat the home. And then obviously, the the once the water is used in the radiators, right, to heat the home, you then take that colder water back down into the ground and heat it up again. Same thing can happen in the summertime. So if you don't go as, as deep, uh, the ground actually stays cooler in parts, right? You go underground, it's usually cooler. Again, uh, for heat, you got to go further down. For cooling, you don't have to go down as far. So we have this hot water that comes out of the house, goes down into the ground where it actually cools off, right? And then goes back into the house, can be used to cool the home, the cooler water. And then again, uh, that water comes back out and goes back down and, and gets cool again. So again, just geothermal, we can cool, we can heat our homes uh, with what is going on underneath Earth's surfaces. The problem is though, we need these hydrothermal reservoirs to be able to do this. And that's why right now it's not economical uh, to, do this, uh, to do this geothermal heating uh, in every part of the world. Uh, basically, you need to drill wells uh, to extract dry steam, wet steam, or hot water water. Uh, the United States is the world's largest producer, uh, but drill drilling geothermal wells is expensive. Uh, in Iceland right now, though, they are using it exclusively and in 23 other countries as well. But if you know Iceland, you know it sits right on top of the Mid-Atlantic Rift. Um, and as a result, it's a highly tectonic area, right, where we have two plates pulling apart right over Iceland. And therefore, there's a lot of uh, volcanic activity there. So you have a lot of magma underneath the ground in that location. And so there is a lot of heat there close to the surface that you can go down and actually tap. Not necessarily the case in many parts, in all parts of the world, especially if you think about here in the New York City, the Ardsley area, right? We don't necessarily have a lot of plate tectonic, we don't have a lot of volcanoes, earthquakes, things like that. So I would argue we would have to go down real far here to tap uh, Earth's energy heat source way down into the ground. And right now it's a little too expensive. And so it's not worth it. 
But again, here's just another area for those of you who are interested in going into environmental science as a career, maybe you can figure out how to cheaply tap uh, Earth's own energy source, right? Earth's own heat source, that geothermal energy. Uh, And maybe you can figure out how to do this in a cheaper way to make it more mainstream. And if you do, I guarantee you will be a very rich person if you could figure out how to do this. Because again, this is a a renewable supply uh, of ways to heat and to cool our home. So again, uh, what we're looking at here is basically, uh, this is Iceland, all right? This is one of these uh, one of these uh, power plants that produce electricity from heat extracted from underground geothermal reservoirs. So you'll notice hot water or steam is pumped under pressure to the surface from underground. Here's that geothermal reservoir, right? Hot water, hot steam down there in the ground because of Earth's own heat uh, heating it up. We pump it up here. Put it into the uh, into this uh, into this power plant here, where the heat exchanger creates steam that runs a turbine that then produces electricity. Right, that's how it works. Heat from underground spins a turbine to power a generator, produce electricity. Uh, steam from the turbine condenses the water, and it's actually pumped back down. Right, so we get the electricity out. The steam that ran this turbine now condenses, falls out, kind of like. Uh, you know, condenses into liquid water, which is then pumped back down into the ground. And the whole process starts all over again. And again, it's a totally renewable process to produce electricity. And what you're looking at down here, here is the electrical plant right next to something called the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. And the electricity from this power plant is actually heating the water in this Blue Lagoon. And so these people can kind of hang out and enjoy some hot water. So again, all because of tapping into Earth's internal heat. But again, in Iceland, that's very close to the surface because it's right on a plate boundary. In other parts of the world, like here, uh, you would have to go much farther down to get to Earth, get Earth's heat. And that's why, unfortunately, right now, it's not necessarily um, cost effective. All right. So geothermal energy, our advantages, disadvantages. What are the advantages? Medium net energy and high efficiency at accessible sites. And that's the key at those accessible sites. Lower carbon dioxide emissions than fossil fuels and low operating costs, again, at favorable sites like Iceland. Disadvantages, high cost, except at those concentrated and accessible sources. So again, right now, for places like us here in Ardsley, um, you have a lot of disadvantage here because uh, we're not easily going to be able to get that. So it's going to cost too much really than it's worth. Uh, You have a scarcity of suitable sites. Again, talking uh, kind of basically what we're just talking about, right? And there is some noise and there will be uh, some carbon dioxide emissions. But again, definitely not as much as burning fossil fuels. All right, so that's geothermal. We talked about wind, we talked about solar. Now we're gonna talk about something called biomass. And what is biomass? Well, it's basically burning wood. Uh, What are the advantages and disadvantages of using biomass as an energy source? So what is solid biomass? It is a potentially renewable resource because trees can grow in a in a person's lifetime, right? So we say if the the resource can be replenished, uh, you know, in a couple of hundred years or so, we call it a renewable resource. So wood, wood can do that. Unfortunately, though, you need large areas of land, right? Because you have to basically cut down all this, all these trees. Uh, an exceeding replenishment rate produces a net gain in emissions of greenhouse gases, right? We talked about that. So if you take, um, if you take too much wood out of the forest and burn it, there's not enough uh, trees left to uh, sequester that greenhouse gases. And so you end up producing a net gain uh, in the environment. Hundreds of years ago, this wasn't happening. People are just cutting down enough wood to, to heat their homes, right? Uh, and so the cycle kind of kind of stayed neutral. Unfortunately, if you start strip cutting and, and clear cutting forests to uh, get wood to burn, uh, again, the net gain of emissions and greenhouse gases will happen because you're exceeding uh, the replenishment rate there. We also have something called liquid biofuels, which can maybe lessen our dependence on oil. Uh, biofuel crops, though, can degrade soil and biodiversity and actually increase emissions. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, we thought liquid biofuels, again, were going to be kind of our savior And we're finding out now uh, that maybe they're really not the way to go. So producing energy by burning solid biomass. What is biomass? Just what it sounds. Mass of biology. Basically living stuff. So plant materials and agricultural waste. 
that can be burned for fuel. That's what we're talking about when we talk about biomass. What are biomass plantations? They're fast growing trees and shrubs that are shrubs for repeated harvest. Uh, wood pellet production degrades forest because you're basically uh, growing all these trees. They're basically a monoculture, then you're strip cutting them down. And again, this is uh, not only degrading the forest, but uh, interrupting that carbon cycle. Uh, burning wood and other forms of biomass does produce carbon dioxide and other pollutants. Again, in the old days, uh, people had just cut down enough to, f uh, to heat their homes. Uh, that balance was kept. But unfortunately, now, obviously, we're cutting down too many trees. And so that is throwing off the balance. So uh, what are our advantages and disadvantages of burning a biomass? So advantages, widely available in some areas, right? There's plenty of wood there. Uh, moderate cost, medium net energy, so not bad. Uh, no net carbon dioxide increase if harvested, burned, and replanted sustainably, right? So if you just take, you know, one or two trees, you know, use that to light heat your home for a couple of months, not going to be a problem. Uh, there's no net carbon dioxide increase. If you clear cut a forest uh, and then burn all that wood, well, then obviously there is going to be a carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere because not enough trees are left to sequester uh, that, that, that carbon dioxide. Plantations can help restore degraded land, but they also can uh, degrade the land as well. Disadvantages, contributes to deforestation. We know what that trouble that brings. Clear cutting can cause soil erosion, water pollution, and loss of wildlife habitat. We've spoken about that. Can open ecosystems to invasive species, and you can increase the carbon dioxide emissions if they're harvested and burn that biomass unsustainably. All right, so once again, understand the advantages and disadvantages of using a biomass, which is a renewable energy resource um, as a way of, of, of energy. All right, let's now talk about these liquid biofuels. So what are these? These are basically uh, ethanol, Biodiesel, all right, ethanol is ethyl alcohol produced from plants. Biodiesel are produced from vegetable oils. The advantages, crops can be thrown, uh, grown throughout the world. There's no net increase in carbon dioxide emissions under certain circumstances. And these biofuels are easy to store and transport. Uh, Brazil makes ethanol from sugarcane residue. Uh, we actually get a medium net energy yield from that. In 2014, 43% of the corn produced in the United States was used to make ethanol ethanol. Corn-based ethanol, however, has a low net energy and producing and burning corn-based ethanol adds 20% more greenhouse gases than actually burning gasoline. Think about that. So it's not only the burning, but the producing of the corn-based ethanol actually adds more greenhouse gases than burning gasoline. In addition, 43% of the corn produced was used to make ethanol. Maybe we should be using that to feed people. So this is kind of the issue with the biofuels. Again, we thought that this may be the saving grace, but we're finding out now uh, after we've kind of been looking at this stuff for 10, 15 years or so, uh, that maybe those resources can be used better elsewhere, right? Maybe the food resources can be used better elsewhere. And at the end of the day, the energy uh, is a low net energy yield, and we're actually putting more greenhouse gases into the environment than burning gasoline. So Again, maybe this isn't really the way that we need to go. Uh, growing corn requires much water. So now we're getting into that issue, right? That we're going to have to use more water uh, to make this type of fuel. Uh, ethanol distilleries produce large volumes of wastewater that now we have to deal with, right? Uh, cellulosic ethanol is an alternative made from inedible cellulose. So this maybe could help. Uh, can be made from grasses that do not require fertilizer or 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 replanting, so maybe the cellulosic ethanol a little bit better than the uh, than the regular one. Um, and actually, algae can produce some biofuel as well. There are some uh, some research going on uh, with algae, uh, and that again is something maybe that you can take a look at uh, if you're uh, going into environmental science as a career. That again may be a little bit better uh, than using that corn-based ethanol. So let's take a look at liquid biofuels. Our trade-offs: advantages, disadvantages. Advantages: reduce carbon dioxide dioxide emissions for some crops, medium net energy for biodiesel from oil palms, and medium net energy for, eth from eth for eth ethanol from sugarcane. Disadvantages. Fuel crops can compete with food crops for land and raise food prices. Again, maybe that 43% of that corn uh, should be used to feed people. Fuel crops uh, can be invasive species in certain parts of the world. Low net energy for corn ethanol and for biodiesel from soybeans 
And actually, you can get some higher uh, carbon dioxide emissions from that corn ethanol. So again, uh, liquid biofuels, maybe not a slam dunk. Uh, they are a renewable energy resource, so that's good. But again, there are a lot of issues with them uh, that maybe need to be worked out uh, before liquid biofuels uh, become the main uh, renewable energy resource. Okay, uh, moving on, we're now going to talk about hydropower. This is power from water. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages? So what are our sources of hydropower? Basically water flowing over dams, tidal flows and ocean waves. And we'll talk about the tidal flows and the ocean waves in just a bit. Uh, downsides, uh, environmental concerns and limited, availabil ability, uh, limited availability of suitable sites uh, for hydropower. So. Uh, what is hydropower again? Producing electricity from falling and flowing water. So hydropower uses kinetic energy of the moving water. So in wind power, right, we use the kinetic energy of the wind. In hydropower, it's using the kinetic energy of moving water. Once again, an indirect form of solar energy. You'll notice here how the sun is so important, right? If we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't have much. So uh, another indirect form of solar energy is hydropower. And it's actually right now the world's leading renewable energy source because we've been using uh, hydropower for hundreds of years. Um, you can look at any old mills here in the, uh, in the United States. In fact, uh, some areas around here, uh, iron mines, for instance, um, how did they, uh, how did they, how did they smelt and how did they melt down the iron and deal with the mines? Well, if you go to a lot of these mines, they actually have water wheels on rivers in the area, and the water wheel would actually turn something in the in the uh, in the mine that would help uh, that would help actually deal with the iron and, and get the iron out of the ore. Or maybe it talks about cornmeal, right? Taking that corn and crushing it into meal um, or flour that then people can use to break bread, right? We have the water wheel in, in the in the river that's turned right you guys have seen this all turn some kind of stone thing inside the inside the whatever hut you have next to the river and that kind of grinds the grinds the flour or, or, or grinds the corn or whatever you happen to put in there right and it's all being done by that water power so we've had this around for 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 a long time people have have known for a long time how um, water power how hydropower uh, can definitely uh, help us top three producers of hydropower China Brazil and the United States Hydropower supplies half of the electricity used on the West Coast of the United States. So again, um, it, it is a large producer of electricity. So trade-offs, advantages, disadvantages of large-scale hydropower. Advantages, high net energy, large untapped potential, low-cost electricity, and low emissions of carbon dioxide and other air pollutants in temperate areas. Disadvantages, large land disbursement and replacement of people. We spoke about this a little bit when we talked about water resources. When you dam up a river, not only are you, uh, you again, creating a huge land disturbance, you may have to displace people, but you're also, and you look at the last one here, disrupts downstream aquatic ecosystems. You're also disrupting the upstream aquatic ecosystems as well, right? You used to have a river now there's a big lake or below or below the dam right the river used to constantly bring silt and and nutrients and now you're not getting that so that's one of the issues with these uh with these big dams we're finding out they do uh, degrade the environment, unfortunately. So that's really the big trade-off. Also high uh, methane emissions from rapid biomass decay in shallow tropical reservoirs. The real issue with hydropower is the fact that it's not really uh, great for the environment because of the issues with the uh, aquatic ecosystems. Um, so again, that's your disadvantages, but there are a lot of advantages to hydropower, and that's why hydropower is currently the most used renewable energy resource in the world. Again, wind may be overtaking it at some point, uh, but that's not the case as of right now. All right, let's talk about using tides and waves to produce electricity. This is done um, not as much as maybe it should be. So here's another area where maybe you can uh, make an impact down the road. But basically, it's producing electricity from flowing water in coastal bays and estuaries. But instead of the water kind of flowing in one direction, in tidal, you have tide comes in, tide comes out tide comes in, tide comes out. So that's how the water is flowing there. It's not flowing in one direction. It's kind of flowing in two directions. Uh, France, Nova, so uh, Nova Scotia, South Korea do have these tidal energy dams. Challenges, again, few suitable sites. You got to have the tide come in a lot and go out a lot 
to actually make this worthwhile from a financial standpoint, because again, the costs are high uh, and you do get a lot of equipment damage from storms and saltwater corrosion. Salt water is the worst. Salt water gets in things. It, it evaporates. It leaves the salt and that basically destroys equipment. Um, so those are some of the challenges uh, with, with, uh, with using the tidal energy. But again, Definitely something uh, that could be used. And if you can figure out a cheap way to do it down the road, again, uh, that could be something, uh, a career path for you. All right. Final thing we're going to talk about here are uh, using hydrogen as an energy source. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using hydrogen? So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen is the simplest and most abundant chemical element, right? As a mass number of one, one electron and one proton. It's a clean energy source provided it is not produced with the use of fossil fuels. Um, unfortunately, though, it has a negative net energy. So right now, because it's so expensive, uh, it's not necessarily uh, being used as much. But down the road, again, here's another area where maybe you can do the research and make this a bit cheaper. Fuel cells combine hydrogen and oxygen to produce electricity and water vapor. That's basically what goes on. We'll talk about it in just a second. Will hydrogen save us? Again, advantages of hydrogen as a fuel eliminates most outdoor air pollution for burning fossil fuels, would greatly slow climate change and ocean uh, acidification if we can use it. Some challenges. Hydrogen is chemically locked in water and organic compounds. Again, right now, a negative net energy, which gives leads to serious limitations. That's why fuel cells are very costly. Uh, and carbon dioxide emissions depend on the method of hydrogen production. So uh, this is basically what we're looking at. Uh, what happens is a fuel cell takes in hydrogen gas and separates the hydrogen atom's electron from its proton, right? So the electrons then flow through a wire to produce electricity. The protons then are passed through a membrane and combined with oxygen gas to actually produce water vapor. So actually hydrogen is a win-win. Not only do you take the hydrogen and produce this clean form of, of, of electricity, again, the le electron comes off and it's used as electricity, it's clean, it's beautiful, but you also, as a byproduct, produce clean water, perfectly pure water, right? This water vapor comes out that then you can condense and you can capture and you can maybe use for people to drink or to irrigate crops. So maybe hydrogen is going to be the saving grace. Again, the problem is this process is so expensive right now that it leads to a negative net energy. So it's not worth it right now. But again, if you can figure out how to how to do this efficiently and, 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 and with a cost that is small, you're going to be rich because this is maybe the way to go. And again, not only do you get pure electricity that is perfectly, perfectly clean to the environment, you also get pure water that you can use as well. So again, a win-win situation when it comes to hydrogen. All right, so let's take a look at our advantages and disadvantages of hydrogen. Can be produced from plentiful water at some sites. No carbon dioxide emissions if produced with uses of renewables. It's a great substitute for oil. And a high efficiency in fuel cells. What are the disadvantages? Negative net energy because it costs a fortune to do it. We don't have the technology to do it cheap. That's where you come in. Carbon dioxide emissions, if produced from carbon-containing compounds, high costs create needs for subsidies. We don't have them as of yet. And you need some kind of hydrogen storage and distribution system. Hydrogen is a little, not necessarily, it's a, uh, it's a little explosive. So that's a, an issue as well. Uh, we have to be able to have a safe, uh, storage and distribution system for the hydrogen because you need the hydrogen to obviously break up to produce the the electrons and the, and 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 the protons. Um, so that's another issue. But again, research you can figure it out how to do this safely and cheaply. Uh, that would be a win win for all involved. All right, so we're almost done. Uh, we talked about the main forms of renewable energy out there. So now kind of to finish up the chapter, how can we make the transition to a more sustainable energy future? We can make the transition by reducing waste. We spoke about this, improving our energy efficiency, using a mix of renewable energy resources and including the environmental and health costs of energy resources in their market prices. That's your full cost pricing. Uh, shifting to a new energy economy, China and the United States are going to be key players 
players in making the shift to a new set of energy resources because each country uses about 20 percent of the world's energy. So us and China are using most of the world's energy. Therefore, we need to be the leaders and the key players in, in making this shift. Important actions to enable the energy shift. Again, use that full cost pricing. If gasoline was $15 a gallon, I uh, guarantee we'd be figuring out a way to fuel our cars without gasoline rather quickly. And again, tax carbon emissions, right? If these power plants, if they, um, if they create so much carbon, tax the admission so they can create less carbon. And how do you do that? You use renewable energy resources. Decrease and eliminate governance subsidies for fossil fuel industries and give them to the renewable resource industries. Establish a national feed-in tariff system. Mandate that certain percentage of electricity generated by utility companies has to come from uh, renewable resources. And increase government fuel efficiency standards on cars. All right, so critical concept, environmental change in leadership, lead by example, work within existing economic and political systems to bring about the environmental improvement that you need, buy sustainable products, and run for a local office. That's how you can be a leader uh, in the environmental world. Run for local office so that you are the ones making the decisions, um, the educated decisions as, as to what as to what we can do. So final slide here, again, more ways uh, that you can help uh, to shift to a more sustainable energy use. Walk, bike, use mass transit, carpool, drive only vehicles that get at least 40 miles per gallon. Have an energy audit done in the place where you live. You already did that. Super insulate the place where you live and plug all air leaks. Use passive solar heating for cooling open windows and use fans. Use programmable thermostat and energy efficient heating and cooling systems, lights and appliances. Turn down your water heater's thermostat and insulate it. Turn off lights, TV, computers, and other electronics when they're not in use. And wash laundry in cold water and air dry it on racks. I'll tell you something. Uh... Way back in the day, I used to date a girl from Italy, um, and I would go over and visit her family. They were actually rather rich, but in Italy, uh, not everyone has dryers, or they do, but they don't really use them as much. Um, and she would hang the clothes out on the, on, on, out on the line um, outside. And I don't know if you've ever worn a, a, a shirt that has been uh, air dried. It is the most beautiful, smelling, fresh, naturally it's awesome. The only bad thing is that they, they get stiff, right? You don't have a fabric softener uh, hanging your clothes on a clothesline. Uh, but I will tell you that wearing clothes from a, a dried on a clothesline, while again, they're a little stiff, they smell and they feel great on you. So maybe try that one day. Uh, maybe try that. Maybe instead of drying your clothes in, the, in your dryer, use it on racks, air dry it outside. All right. Well, that concludes part two of my lecture on chapter 15, energy efficiency and renewable energy. And as always, thank you for listening.